a dear IPK Southeast Asia project colleague, you know, experts and distinguished participants. Firstly, let me welcome you to the webinar on geographical indications organized by the IPT Southeast Asia project. It is the new um, normal way that we meet over the virtual meeting program today, and I'm convinced that this will be an efficient form of knowledge sharing uh, during days of cautiousness toward the pandemic. Since the enactment of Thailand's GI Act in 2003, GIs have become one of the most effective tools for us in promoting the importance of intellectual property protection and commercialization to our localities, as well as in helping our communities in extracting extra incomes from their local wisdom and uniqueness. To date, 126 GIs have been registered and protected in Thailand. A vast amount of income has returned to communities and a considerable number of Thai GIs have gained exceptional reputation among the consumers worldwide. With a view to further take more value out of the protected GIs, the DIP Thailand um, is attaching high importance to the quality control mechanism implemented by each of the local GI communities to ensure that the Thai GIs effectively represent their high qualities and uniqueness. This is a challenging task, considering that many of our GI products are agricultural ones where the quality of the goods depends heavily on the uncontrollable factors like quality of soil and air and amount of rain and water. Nonetheless, the intensive involvement from all of those in the fields, including the local governments and the producers themselves, are strongly encouraged and required. On the marketing front, we have been working with many potential distribution channels, including the local department stores, uh, shops, and even professional carrier services to make sure that GI products could timely reach their potential consumers with ease, while the quality and characteristics are well preserved we also introduce some producers to adapt themselves to take full advantage of new marketing tools, including e-commerce websites and platforms. Furthermore, a redesign of packaging for some specific products has been advised too. Even all our endeavors and tasks from the past and until today, undeniably, we take the protection and commercialization of GIs very seriously. So it is to my delight that the IPK Southeast Asia project and the EU IPO share the same view with us on this very important matter. During these two separate day webinar, all participants will have a chance to learn from the EU's experts on how GIs are protected in the EU and to what extent the control mechanisms are put in place for the European GI product. And I trust that the knowledge and experience captured today will enlighten our perspectives on how to develop GIs for our localities. Furthermore, as Thailand is considering amending our 17 year old GI Act and the pending trade negotiation between Thailand and EU may be resumed in a foreseeable future. It is only beneficial for us to learn from you on how uh, DOU is protecting GIs and what to expect if the negotiation is actually resumed. So without undue delay, I would like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation again to the European and the EU uh, IPOs, IPK Southeast Asia, uh, along with uh, all of you here today and, and the team for making this project possible. I also thank the expert for taking their time off uh, their busy schedules uh, to be with us today. And I wish the event both today and on July the 19th uh, success and that we all have fruitful exchange of information and experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much, you very much. Sarah. Thailand is actually the host country of the IPK Southeast Asia project. So thank you very much for your support. 
uh, Mr. Uh, Raymond uh, Jera, you have the floor, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning for the ones of you uh, which are in Europe as myself. I'm delighted to uh, be able to pronounce some uh, introductory words today. And I uh, would like to thank IPK Southeast Asia, as well as uh, all the distinguished uh, guests uh, and participants to this webinar. Um, in effect, the link between uh, local specialties and the territory and its people has always been an important part of a national identity. And this is true in the EU, as it is true in the Southeast Asian countries, and it is true all around the world. The EU has had a very a peculiar patterns of development uh, of the protection of geographical indication, as well before 1992, which is uh, the date of the first EU legislative framework for foodstuff GIs, uh, already member states of the European Union had established their own rules to protect names of specific foodstuffs or wines or spirits or other products. In the EU, uh, the process has been built by building blocks. Uh, we started uh, with wine, geographical indications being protected at the EU level, then the spirits, and then, as I said before, in 92, with the food. As you uh, may see, uh, all these uh, three big categories of products are agricultural products. And the EU has developed uh, an intellectual property tool uh, that we call a sui generis system for the protection of the rights of producers, producer groups and farmers to have their own intellectual property properly protected. The basic aim of this tool is twofold, as we will see uh, more in detail this morning via the webinar. It gives consumers a guarantee of authenticity, quality, and distinctiveness, which is linked to the origin of the product. At the same time, it protects producers from competitors that try to exploit the reputation of these high quality products. If I have to pick the main features of the EU system, it's indeed the fact that those rights are not public, are not private, they are collective. And all GI holders who comply with the product specification have the right to use the name at stake. The other specificity of the EU system is that that system is free of charge for uh, producers, so it does not cost a single dollar or euro uh, for them to be protected, that the protection is unlimited in time, and it is enforced administratively on top of via judicial means. That system has produced over time uh, the today result, which is that more than 5,000 geographical indications are protected in the EU, either by via the applications that are directly submitted into our system, or via international agreements that are concluded between the EU and third countries. I will spare you the long list uh, of very famous uh, European GIs, uh, but I'm proud to say that our system is not just open uh, for EU GIs, it is open also for third country GIs. And over time, we have managed to protect, uh, for instance, uh, products from Southeast Asian countries like uh, Kampot pepper from Cambodia or Kafai Doitun from Thailand or Kopi Arabica Gaia from Indonesia, just to provide some examples. There are a few elements which are important to uh, recall is that geographical indications is not just an intellectual property right, it produces economic results on the ground and in particular it is clear that uh, GI products and GI farmers uh, bearing a geographical indication achieve a price premium in the market. And this pr price premium is very important. According to recent studies, in average, it's at least two times higher than the sales value of a comparable standard product in the same market. 
GI schemes create spillover effects into the economy of the region at stake uh, and the marketing of the region as such through a GI product brings publicity, foster agricultural tourism, creates more job and job and growth opportunities. To conclude, it is clear that the GI scheme is a success story of the EU agricultural policy and that we like to share this experience with our trading partners. I'm sure that today we will provide uh, via this webinar a perfect platform for a very rich exchange. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thanks to the IPK team and the Thai authorities for inviting me to participate in this webinar on geographical indications. And I wanted to say hello to all the participants online. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to talk about the protection of geographical indication in the European Union. I will first uh, present a quick overview of the uh, European uh, of the legal system in the European Union. And then I will address two specific topics. Uh, first, the, the different concepts we find in the European legis legislation. And by this, I refer to the different quality schemes that are regulated in the, in the legislation. And I will also address, uh, or I will also cover the, the registration process. Finally, if I still have time, I will leave aside the, the legal aspect and to talk a bit about the practical benefits that come with these intellectual property rights, okay? Practical benefits for producer, consumers, and also society. A uh, scope of protection, I wanted to first uh, explain that the scope of protection will not be covered by my presentation today. There is a reason for this. Uh, we have scheduled another webinar on the 21st in which I specifically cover this, this topic, which I, I'm sure it's very interesting for, for IP practitioners. Going straight to the point, uh, the, the legal system in the, in the European legislation, we have, as, as uh, Ra uh, Mr. Raimondo Serra already explained, we have a sui generis uh, uniform system, which is governed by European regulation and which have a direct uh, effect in the 27 member states, okay? Uh, the first uh, regulation on, uh, in Europe, a geographical indication, dates back to 1992. This, this was already explained by Mr. Raimondo Serra. But the system was not really implemented until 1996. This was when the first uh, geographical indication were registered at the European level. It's also interesting to, to point out that the system is also ex exhaustive. It has a, an exhaustive nature, meaning that uh, the European regulation prevents the application of national legislation on those topics that are specifically regulated by the European le legislation. Okay, so uh, the topics that we have uh, governed by the regulations, by the European regulation, are First, the concepts and requirements, also the scope of protection, the registration process, and finally, the control system, the control schemes. And I refer to the uh, controls that must be uh, carried out in order to guarantee that all the products that are put in the marketplace, bearing the geographical indication, actually fulfill with the uh, technical requirements, okay? <clears throat> there are some topics that are not covered by the European regulations. These are uh, the actions against infringement. So uh, we have the scope of protection, which is defined by the European regulation. But uh, for the action that aren't uh, um, that are available for the group of producers to uh, for for acting against infringement, then we have to apply the national legislation. And also uh, two complex topics: ownership of the geographical indication and management of this intellectual property right these are not specifically governed by the European regulation, okay? In this regard, we must again apply the national legislation. <clears throat> I say this is a complex topic for, just to, to give an example. For instance, in, in Spain, geographical indications are not owned by the group of producers. They are managed by the group of producers, but uh, the holder is not uh, the group of producers. Okay? Here in, in Spain, geographical indications are considered to be a right of public domain. Okay? So they belong to the state itself or to the particular region. 
they are a collective right of course they are managed by the by the group of producers they are the group of producers are entitled and are they are given with this function very important function to manage the geographical indication but in terms of ownership they are owned by the state or the the specific region and then if we move uh, to the specific regulation we have in europe we have four different regulations dealing with geographical indication each of one governing a specific uh, kind of good so we have a regulation for wines another regulation for aromatized wines uh, another regulation for spirit drinks and finally a regulation covering the rest of agricultural products and food stocks okay four different regulations but it's important to point out that they, they are quite similar okay so the system is harmonized just that we have this product approach in, in which we have a specific regulation for a specific kind of product but uh, the, the system is quite harmonized and specifically those topics that are probably most important for IP attorneys or IP uh, practitioners are exactly the same in the four regulation meaning uh, scope of protection is exactly the same the registration process is also very similar and so on so these are the products that uh, up to date can be protected under a geographical indication in the European Union. So as far as uh, other kind of products like, uh, like non-agricultural products, currently they cannot be protected under a quality scheme in the European uh, le legislation. Okay. Anyway, it's clear that the European Commission is considering extending the system of geographical indication also to non-agricultural products. This regard, we have two landmarks in this process. Back in October of uh, 2015, the European Parliament issued a resolution requesting the uh, European Commission to pass a legislation on this topic, on geographical indication for non-agri products. Okay? And very recently, in February this year, the European Commission published a study on the economic aspects of geographical indication protection at the European level for non-agricultural products. Okay, so uh, my impression is that the uh, possible system on geographical indication for non-agricultural products may be in the pipeline, but currently we don't have a system for that. Okay, at the European level. Okay, so. Uh, non-agricultural products could not be uh, protected under the geographical indication scheme in the European Union. Okay. Well, if you remember, first I said that uh, the uh, legal system in the European Union has an exhaustive character. Okay, meaning that uh, those topics that are governed by the regulation cannot be governed by the national legislation. Okay. In this regard, that this means that uh, member states are entitled to pass legislation or to protect a uh, geographical indication for non-agricultural products because it is not governed or regulated by the European legislation. Uh, we could not get a protection for the whole European Union, but we could get a, a protection for uh, specific territories in the European Union, which are currently giving some kind of protection for uh, non-agricultural GIs. Okay. And now moving to the second topic uh, the concept the different quality schemes we have in the european union this is a very particular characteristic of the uh, system in the european union we have uh, two different concepts for a uh, geographical indication okay so we have a protected des designation of origin and we have also protected geographical indication when it comes to the schemes for wines and agricultural products in food stuff. Okay, we have these two different concepts. Uh, I will explain later on the, the differences between each another, uh, the PDO and the PGI. And when we talk about aromatized wine and spirit drinks in the European legislation, we will find just one concept: protected geographical indication. Okay, uh, I know this is different from other from other uh, legal frameworks. We are going to see what are the differences between PGI, protected geographical indication, and a PDO, protected designation of origin. Here I have uh, uh, explained the, the definition of each concept, and as you can see, I have also highlighted the differences between one and the other concept. Okay, so starting with the protected geographical indication, 
Uh, this is a name which identifies a product as originated in a specific place, region, or country, whose quality, reputation, or other characteristics are essentially attributable to its geographical origin. Okay, this is the link between the product and the geographical origin, and for which at least one of the production steps take place in the defined geographical area. Okay, just one production step must, at least one, must take place in the geographical area. Okay. If we have a look to the definition of protected uh, designation of origin, uh, well, first it starts in the same way. It's a name which identifies a product as originating in a specific place, a region, or exceptionally a country, where exceptionally the reason of this uh, exceptional uh, character is because a country is normally is a larger territory, so it would be more difficult to find a specific characteristic in such a large uh, territory. Okay. Anyway, again, the definition is this, a name which identifies a product from a specific place and whose quality or characteristics, and this in the topic of the, of the link between the product and the geographical origin, we find the first difference between PDO and PGI. A PDO can only be based on quality and characteristics, leaving aside reputation. And then, well, quality and characteristics that are essentially or exclusively due to its particular, uh, its geographical origin, okay? And we find here a second difference, a qualitative difference, okay? The, the link must be exclusively or essentially due to its geographical origin, okay? It, it's, it's remarking a tighter or a stronger link with the territory. And finally, in this link, we might find both natural and human power. Okay, so there must be uh, natural factors, a specific soil, a specific weather or climate, and human factors, specific techniques, traditional know-how, which have an effect on the specific characteristics of the product. And finally, as regards the production steps, all the production steps must take place in the geographical area. Okay, so the production of the raw materials, the processing of the product, even the preparation, if so, must take place in the geographical area. And finally, on, only with regard to, to geographical indication for wines, in a PGI, at least 85% of the, of the grapes, of the raw materials that are used in the production of the wine, must come from the geographical area. Whereas in the PDO, all the grapes must come from the geographical area. So I think uh, it's clear what's the difference here. A PDO requires a stronger or a tighter link between the specificity of the product and the uh, characteristics of the geographical area where it is produced, okay? A remark here, in terms of protection, uh, both, both concepts, are afforded the same level of protection in the law, okay? <clears throat> very, very beautifully, this is just number. Currently in the European Union, we have almost uh, 4,000 geographical indication. This, these are not registered, apply for 4,000 geographical indication altogether. In terms of registration, you have it there in the, in the right side. Uh, it's around 3,300 3, uh, geographical indications already registered in the European Union. Okay? As you can see, most of them relate to wines or agri-food. And uh, we have also a number of geographical indications registered under the sui generis uh, European Union system, which come from third countries. Okay? Currently, there are 69 geographical indications applied for. I think in terms of registration, it's more or less 40 geographical indications already registered coming from uh, third countries, okay? And now changing topic and moving to the uh, registration process. These are some characteristics. I focus on the characteristics that could be more interesting for a, a, a producer or group of producers coming from, from, from third countries. Okay, as uh, Mr. Raimondo Serra already, already explained in, in his opening remarks, the system is open to uh, third countries GIs. Okay, so those geographical indications that are already registered in the country of origin can uh, go through the 
the European uh, process of uh, registration under the sui generis system. This is what I'm going to explain. Or another possibility to, to, to have protection uh, in the European Union will be by means of a bilateral agreement between countries. Okay. So, but again, even if uh, the European Commission is concluding uh, many agreements on this topic with third countries, which are uh, affording protection to their geographical indication, uh, it's interesting to know that uh, still the producer have the possibility to apply for a registration directly before the European Commission. Okay, so as regards the characteristics on the registration process, uh, it is first, it is free of fees, uh, not for application, not for registration. Of course, the right is acquired through registration, as I already said, it's open to third countries. And the, the, the process has normally two stages, okay? One national uh, phase and, and a European phase. Okay. This would be, of, of course, for European geographical indication. They must uh, pass a, first a national examination and then they will have to pass a European examination, okay? If we uh, talk about uh, non-EU products, of course, they don't have to go through the national stage. Instead, the applicant must prove that the geographical indication is already protected in the country of origin. Okay. The competent authority will be the Director General for Agriculture of the European Commission. And finally, the, the documents the applicant must submit are uh, first the product specification, a single document, and additional information. Okay. So right now I'm going to uh, have a, a detailed view on the product specification just uh, to explain that a single document is just a, a summary of the product specification, which uh, is uh, published in the official journal. This is the, the document that is published in the official journal of the European Union. Okay, but anyway, the applicant must also fill in this, this single document. And additional information will be uh, technical reports uh, supporting the the specificity of the product we are claiming or evidence of the protection in the country of origin and so on. This would be the content of a product specification for a geographical indication. Okay, this is, we call it in the European Union legislation product specification in, I know in other uh, legislation is called book of, of specifications. Anyway, it's a very important document that uh, explains all the characteristics of the geographical indication and the product it protects, okay? So first we must uh, disclose the name we want to be protected. In this regard, it's important to, to highlight that uh, this must be a name that has already been used either in trade or in common language, okay? And uh, actually we must submit evidence of this prior use, okay? Uh, so you can understand the important here, the important point here is that the name should be already working as a geographical indication in the market, okay? Meaning that uh, uh, it should be used uh, in order to identify a specific pr product coming from a specific origin, okay? Then we must uh, disclose a description of the product with the raw materials, the physical, chemical, and microbiological or organoleptic characteristics. Okay, this would be the full description of the final product. Okay, uh, the important here would be to focus on what it is characteristic of the product we are trying to protect. Okay. Uh, we should uh, put a focus on those characteristics that make the product uh, special or that uh, uh, distinguishes them from a product of the same nature but not produced in the geographical origin. We must also provide a definition of the geographical area where the product is produced, the method for obtaining the product, that would be all the production steps, okay, from the production of the raw materials until we have the final product. Then the link, we must justify the link between the quality, the characteristic of the reputation of the product and the geographical area. Also the system of verification of compliance uh, with the specification. Again, I'm not going to talk about the control, the, the verification of compliance, because uh, 
I will address this topic also in the next seminar we have for, for the 21st of this month. We must also disclose uh, who is the body verifying, an independent body verifying that all the products that uh, build the geographical indication actually uh, fulfill the technical requirements. And finally, if there are some mm, uh, labeling rules that mm, the producer must follow. Okay. For sure, the most important section of the, of the product specification will be the link. Okay? So this is, the link is what justifies the protection as a, a geographical indication. Okay? And here I have a practical explanation of what is the link. Okay? In order to um, justify the link, we should first uh, identify what is the product's specificity, okay? Whether it is a specific quality or a specific characteristic or a specific reputation that the product has uh, due to its geographical origin, okay? Once we have this, we should next identify the particular condition of the geographical environment which have an effect on the product's specificity, okay? This can be either natural or human factors. Okay, natural factors would be a specific soil, a native variety, or a native animal breed, which is present in the area. And human factors would be know-how, traditional te techniques that are, have been put in place in the area for, for, for a long time. Okay, and the relation between these two aspects would be the link. Okay, and by the relation I refer of how the uh, specific characteristic of the product is due to this particular condition of the uh, geographical area. How this condition that we are disclosing have an effect on these characteristics of the product we are trying to protect. Okay, this will be uh, the link and uh, that uh, uh, issue that justifies the protection as a geographical. Well, finally, some remarks for the uh, registration process uh, for uh, non-EU products, okay? As I already said, the, the applicant should uh, justify that uh, the product is already, or the name, the name is already protected in the country of origin, okay? But uh, you must take into account that uh, this would be, I mean, this uh, evidence of privacy protection would be ide ideally as a geographical indication protection, okay? But still, if not, we can rely on a trademark protection, collective mark, certification mark, or even a protection under unfair competition law or labeling law, okay? And why is the European Commission so flexible here in this, in this point, okay? Because, uh, well, you can imagine that uh, we are aware that not all the states or not all the territories have a, a specific legislation, a sui generis legislation of geographical indication, okay? So for those territories where uh, there is no uh, geographical indication system, a group of producers could still uh, uh, file an application and qualify its product as a geographical indication, provided that some sort of protection is already uh, enjoyed in the country of origin. But again, if in your country, there is a sui generis system and geographical indication, you should be ideally able to prove that the name is already protected as a GI itself. As regards the applicant, where we are talking about, uh, we are talking about a product from, from uh, non-EU products, the applicant can either be the authorities of the country or the group of producers it, itself, okay? And our application will be examined by the DG Agri, as I already said. Uh, when the, con the condition are fulfilled, the, the application will be published in the official journal of the European Union. And if not, if they are not fulfilled, the, the application will be rejected. Okay? So for you to know, in this examination, it's very, it's, uh, very common that the DG Agri engage in a conversation with the applicant. Okay, so it's, it's most of the, of the, in most of the cases, the DG Agri uh, analyzes the, the whole dossier application and it's uh, normally they ask for some clarification or some, some additional information on some specific topic. This is very, very common, okay? And once the application has passed the, the examination by the DG Agri, 
the, uh, the single document, that uh, brief summary I, I explained, uh, would be published in the official journal, okay? And it would be published for purposes of third parties of opposition, okay? Opposition can be based on uh, the fact that the condition are not fulfilled or on the fact that the, the name the name proposed for, for protection is generic or a conflict with a prior PDO or PGI. And this is important as regards as conflict with trademarks, um, generally speaking, a prior trademark will mean not sufficient to a prior trademark which contains or consists of the, on the same name that uh, we are trying to protect as a geographical indication, this prior trademark, general, generally speaking, will, be not, uh, will not be an admissible uh, ground for opposition. Okay, so only trademark that are reputed uh, in a way that the use of the later geographical indication would be liable to mislead the consumer as to the true identity of the product would be uh, admissible as an opposition ground. Okay, so for other trademarks with uh, not having this kind of reputation, uh, the situation would be that the later geographical indication would coexist with uh, the prior registered trademark. Okay. If no opposition is filed, then the, the geographical indication will be registered and protected. And uh, whenever an opposition is filed, first the, uh, the DG Agri, the, the European Commission, will request the party to engage in consultations. Okay. If no agreement is reached in this consultation, then the, the European Commission uh, will issue its decision on, on the registration of the applied geographical indication. Some remarks after registration, uh, and again, uh, um, this, this was already advanced by Mr. Raimondo Serra, uh, the geographical indication may be used by any operator marketing a product which complies with the, with the specification. So, uh, those products cannot be deprived from the right to use the geographical indication. Uh, the producers uh, have the right to identify the product as a PD or a PGI, and also to use the uh, European official symbols. Uh, the registration also comes with an obligation, an obligation to verify that all the products being the geographical indication actually fulfill the technical specifications. And finally, well, the PDO is not subject to renewals. It will be registered forever. And uh, the producer also gets a, an ex officio protection in the European territory, okay? Grounds for cancellation, we have only two. Uh, the geographical indication can be invalidated when compliance with the specification are not assured. So this is when the control system fails. And finally, when a geographical indication uh, has not been used for a period of at least seven years, okay? That would be the only two grounds for cancellation, in addition, of course, for a, a withdrawal of the application that the group of producers uh, will also be entitled to file a withdrawal, okay? And now my last part, if I still have, I believe so, five minutes. As I said, I wanted to leave aside the, the legal aspects and talk a bit about the practical benefits that come with this kind of intellectual property rights. Okay. I uh, identify some, I will go very quickly, I identify some, some benefits for producers, consumers, and also society. Well, for pr producers, it's, it's clear, uh, they get an exclusivity over the name. Uh, they get a right, which is a collective right, so it is not reserved for a single producer, but for all the producers that are located in the area and which uh, who meet the uh, technical requirements. This is also important, geographical indication for protection to already existing products, so uh, there is no need for uh, uh, an innovation or la large investments on behalf of the producers. And uh, geographical indication are also a very uh, powerful marketing tool. Uh, it transforms generic products into differentiated products. Normally with the registration, uh, the, the consumers, sorry, the, the producer would be able to get an extra price for, for the products. There are some, some uh, this was already also highlighted by, by Mr. Serra. There are some stu studies uh, carried out by the European Commission highlighting how the consumers are willing to pay uh, an extra price for a product that uh, it's protected under a quality scheme. 
and finally they, they get ex officio protection as I already said. And what's for consumers? Well, um, they <coughs> they also get some benefits. Uh, the geographical indications uh, protects them against false information or deceptive information. It is a warranty of origin, quality, uh, and so on. Uh, it also prevents a standardization of products. And this means that probably the consumer will have a wider choice uh, when, when purchasing the products and so on. And finally, I wanted to focus on the uh, benefits for the society or the, the local community. Okay, and I believe well this is all related. It's very important from my opinion. It's all related. Uh, it is clear that this kind of, of uh, rights, uh, geographical indication, contribute to prevent migration. Okay, migration of the pro production uh, because since we are defining a geographical area and we are explaining that the product must be produced here, then uh, we are no longer or the producers are no longer able to. Uh, migrate the production to other to other uh, territories, okay? And this comes with uh, the creation or the maintenance of jobs and economic activity in the area. It generates wealth, wealth that is attached to the geographical area. It prevents the population of rural areas. It also contributes to sustainable development and preservation of the biodiversity. Uh, just think about uh, when when I uh, talk about the natural factors present in the area, how this uh, the, the, the link of a geographical indication can be based, for instance, on, on a specific uh, variety or a fruit variety or a specific uh, a, a native animal breed we have in the area. Well, as long as we are uh, creating whole sector around this native variety or this uh, native animal breed, this will uh, contribute to preserve this biodiversity we have in the area. And finally, it also gives visibility to the, to the area, mainly uh, in terms of tourism, okay? And now, and this will be the last topic. This was just uh, an example I wanted to, to explain on these benefits I was uh, explain it before theoretically, okay? So here we, we have a practical example of how a geographical indication can contribute or can generate all these benefits I was uh, talking about, okay? So I uh, took a case uh, from, from, from here in Alicante in Spain. Uh, uh, we have a geographic, two geographical indication for a nougat. Uh, the product is nougat, it's a sweet product. Uh, basically made of uh, almonds and honey, okay, that is produced in Gijona. Gijona is a very small village in here in Alicante, okay. Uh, we have data uh, stating that the production of this nougat in Gijona, in the province of Alicante, started at least in the 16th century, okay, century. And uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, the name, the name of Ijona and the product they produce here started to gain great prestige and reputation in the market, okay? So uh, if before the producer of, of, uh, of this nougat, they were uh, selling the product mainly in Spain, with this uh, prestige they gained, they started selling the product also in Europe, in North Africa and in America, okay? So uh, since the demand uh, increased for this product, the, uh, the, the, the producers uh, started a process of opening uh, or establishing offshore production plants, okay, which were established mainly in Argentina, Cuba, and the north of Africa, and so on, okay. Of course, this was before the geographical indication was registered, okay. So we have that the product gained great prestige in the, in the market, and the uh, some um, uh, portion of the production uh, migrated to other countries and abroad uh, the small village of Gijona. Later on in the 1930s, uh, these offshore plants uh, were locked out, mainly due to the Spanish Civil War, okay? So all the production came back again to the small village in Gijona, okay? And later on, in 1931, the uh, the name, the two names, this is 
I didn't display this. There's two different kind of products, uh, two different kind of nougats. Okay, one is the, the soft one is called Gijona, uh, the other one is called Turondalica. Okay, so both names uh, were um, were uh, granted some kind of geographical indication protection at the national level. Okay, here in Spain. That was in 1939, before we have a, a sui generis system of geographical indication in the European Union. Okay? Later on, when the system was implemented at the European Union in 1996, uh, both uh, names were registered as a PGI uh, in the European Register. Okay? What were the, consequence, the consequences here? I mean, if we had that uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, the production, some part of the production was migrated to, to, to third countries. After the recognition of the geograph geographical indication, this was not possible any longer. So all the production remained in the uh, geographical area. And we have some uh, more or less current data here. Uh, uh, currently there are 22 uh, companies producing and marketing the, the product, all located in Gijona. The total revenue for both uh, geographical indication for both products, as you can see, amounts almost to 16 million euros per year. And it is the, it estimated that at least uh, 2,000 jobs in the area are linked in a way or another to the production of uh, Turron, of uh, Nougat, okay? Uh, in, in, in within a, a total population of the, of the village of just 7,000 uh, inhabitants, okay? So uh, this is an example of how economic activity and wealth is created and uh, kept in the uh, geographical area, in a very small village and rural, in a rural area. And also uh, the, the, the protection of this name as geographical indication has contributed to the generation of uh, adjacent industries. Okay, so nowadays Gijona is also very well known in Spain and also in Europe for the produ production of ice creams, chocolates, or uh, pastries, or kind of pastries or sweets. Okay, so this was just uh, in a way to put in, in a real case and in practical terms the theoretical benefits of the geographical indication I was uh, talking about, okay? And with this, I finish, and I thank you all for, for their attention, and I would be happy to hear your, your question and your comments at the end of the presentation. Good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone. So I'm very pleased uh, well, to, be, to get the opportunity to present the, the EU approach on the protection of its GIs in the international market. I would like to thank, uh, of course, the, the EU uh, IPK team and the DIP uh, staff for their uh, organization. I will try to make it quite simple and short because time is flying and um, then uh, we still got a bit of time for questions answer possibly. So basically I will try to answer two questions. It's why uh, do we need to protect uh, EU GIs in the international market? Uh, well, as you heard already, there are more than 3000 GIs uh, registered and protected in the EU. Some of them, not all of them, but a substantial uh, share of them are commercialized now worldwide. And uh, it could happen uh, for some of them that they face unfair competition. So we have to protect them. Otherwise, they would have no chance to survive and to be commercialized uh, in international uh, market. And the second question, of course, is how does the EU uh, protect its geographical indications in this uh, international markets? One of the uh, main uh, track is through uh, international agreements, bilateral uh, free trade agreements. Uh, so I will stop a bit more on that, but it could also be at the multilateral level. Uh, I will just say a word on this uh, in my presentation. So on the first part on why uh, these uh, GIs deserve uh, protection. Uh, first, I will say a few words on the sales value. 
there was a study made in 2010 in the EU and it was updated uh, very recently. It's uh, now published and publicly available, uh, this study. Uh, and, uh, well, at first I want to say that it still concerned and covered the EU 28. So in the figures I will give you now, UK is included. So as you can see in this study, the sales value of the EU GIs, so more than 3000 GIs, represent more than 75 billion euro in 2017. Most of it is uh, covered by wines, 51%. Foodstuff GIs represent 35% of this value and spirits around 13%. All of this uh, covers 7% of the total EU food and drink sector sales value. So you can see that it is substantial. And when it comes to exports, and then I make the link with international markets, the export value of GIs represent 11.5 billion euro or 15.5% of the total EU food and drink uh, industry exports to, uh, well, outside um, the EU. So you can imagine that this uh, very important value uh, justifies uh, some uh, protection. Where are these geographic indications exported? So still in the same study, you can find uh, some details about the main destinations. So you can see that the first destination for EU exports of geographic indications is the US market, around 30%. And then we got a batch of countries uh, with substantial um, export shares, around 6 7% from Switzerland, Singapore, as it concerns uh, the ASEAN region. And from Singapore, we know it may be traded and commercialized in other uh, neighboring countries. Canada, China, Japan, uh, Hong Kong are also important uh, destinations for the export of EU GIs. Apart from the fact that there is a value to protect and producers to, to protect, I will not really come back on the, the value for the producers because it was already covered by ITOS protect, uh, presentation. We need to protect uh, geographic indica geographical indication through international bilateral agreements because actually uh, EU considered that the protection at the multilateral level is not sufficient. First, you are familiar with the TRIPS uh, agreement. Uh, well, the TRIPS agreement proposes uh, a basic protection for geographical indications. Uh, notably for foodstuff and other uh, products, and higher level of protection, PRIPS 22, uh, 23, sorry, for uh, alcoholic beverages. But even if uh, the TRIPS provide for a certain level of protection, as long as there is no international register of geographical indication, there is nothing to say that a specific product should be protected by the countries. So the countries, basically, they have to comply with TRIPS principles, but uh, we don't know which products are covered by these uh, provisions. Independently from that, uh, the TRIPS 22, uh, according to the EU, offers insufficient protection because first it is a subjective protection. Uh, so we have to prove that the consumers are misled. If you don't prove that they are uh, misled, actually you could still comply with TRIPS and uh, you can make use of the reputation of the products. So for instance, here you got a kind of ham, which is commercialized. I don't know which product, in which country this, this picture was taken, but it says prosciutto parma style. So clearly it's not saying that it is parma ham, it says parma style. So it's perfectly compatible with TRIPS article 22. Uh, it's not an infringement, but we consider that the use of such practices is still using the reputation of the genuine prosciutto uh, di Parma, Parma ham, and uh, creates unfair competition for the genuine products, which complies with very specific uh, production characteristics and higher production costs. The Article 22 doesn't protect against translation. Uh, so this is another weakness of the TRIPS uh, agreement. And as I already just, well, as I've just mentioned, it doesn't protect against um, expressions such as type, style, uh, taste, uh, whatever. So for instance, we could say um, Deutung Kaffee uh, taste like, or Deutung Coffee type, for instance, it would be perfectly compatible with TRIPS Article 22. And actually it is also compatible with the Thailand legislation, for instance, which uh, does not provide for higher level of protection for this kind of product. So the EU is trying to get higher level of protection. 
in many places, there are also use of the reputation of genuine products for a few products. So it doesn't concern a big batch of products, but very often some dairy products are confronted with uh, unfair competition uh, and evocations in third countries market and notably in Southeast uh, Asia. So that's what we call evocation here. I put two pictures of non-genuine uh, products and uh, you can see here that it's I think these pictures were taken in uh, Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur uh, maybe a year ago. So you can see here a classical case of evocation where it says feta. Feta is written with two T when feta cheese in Greece is of course a geographical indication is spelled F-E-T-A. So here they're not using the name as such but this is a clear case of evocation where they try to use the same um, the same sound and the same spelling almost than the genuine product. Uh, sometimes we also find it with the H. And here, very interestingly, none of them are genuine products, but on the left part, you see feta cheese traditional. So consumers could think that this is really uh, feta cheese from Greece, probably made with cow milk because there is no mention of what type of milk is produced. Very cheap price, 22 ringgits for this piece of cheese, which has nothing very specific. It can be done anywhere in the world with the same taste. On the right part, the same company is producing another category of still fake or non-genuine products, but with higher cost. With You can see feta cheese still with the tutti, still the evocation, but at least it's not as bad because they use the same raw material uh, than would be used in Greece, goat's milk. But you can see here that of course, when you change the production uh, methods and when you use higher um, value uh, raw material, of course, they cannot sell it at the same price. So even if it's, if it's not a genuine product, this one is sold almost two times uh, more expensive than the, what they call traditional uh, co-milk cheese. So this type of revocation the EU is trying to get rid of in the negotiations. There are some possible solutions. So some rebranding is possible. Actually, we did it in Europe um, in the past. So here you can, uh, you, you can find some cheeses, which is, um, you cannot find any mention of feta, for instance. So it says white cheese Mediterranean style. So with that, we have no problem as such. The EU is not trying to get rid of these products produced sometimes even in Europe, but most of the time it's produced in Australia, in the US or in New Zealand. Uh, so we have no problem with such products to be sold in Singapore, in Thailand, in Vietnam, or wherever in the world, as, lo as long as they do not use the reputation of the product. And rebranding is a, is a possibility for this, uh, for this product. Now, how do we protect uh, the EU flagship GIs uh, in international markets? Uh, so basically, we try to do it through bilateral agreements, free trade agreements. Now it's impossible for the EU to negotiate a free trade agreement with any partner in the world if there is no uh, GI chapter with positive outcome in this agreement. Politically, it would just simply be impossible because we would not get the support from the member states to conclude and to sign an agreement. So it is what we call a must have. No, GI chap no good GI chapter in agreement means no free trade agreements with Europe. This said, we do not try to impose uh, the EU legislation in the third country's legislation. Uh, it would not, this would not be realistic, but we need some uh, added value in the agreement. I will come back in a minute on the main uh, key elements we try to find in this, uh, in this agreements chapters. So the objective of the EU negotiation, of course, is to add uh, value as compared to TRIPS basic provisions. Otherwise, we could, in most of the countries which are WTO members, we could protect our GIs with TRIPS uh, level of protection, even if, we, if it would take a lot of time to do it, because we would have to register individually each of our GIs, which would take too much time, uh, would be very costly, uh, and sometimes uh, we would be confronted with um, non-valid uh, opposition, for instance. So clearly we try to get more than what would be possible under TRIPS when we negotiate further agreements with our trade partners. So the aim is to establish a list of EU GIs uh, with third countries uh, GIs and to protect uh, this list reciprocally. We do not, in most of the cases, intend to protect three more than 3,000 GIs because it would be considered disproportionate 
and because also it would not be realistic, many of the EU GIs are not even traded outside Europe. So what we do for each of our negotiations, in principle, we try to establish a list of um, geographical, in uh, geographical indications which present an interest to be protected in the specific market. So by experience, it could be a list from 150 to 200, 300, and in some uh, occasions, much more uh, geographical indications to be protected in the agreement. So what kind of um, provisions uh, we consider added value and what are the must have provisions we want to find in this uh, bilateral agreement? First, we need direct protection via the agreement. So when I say uh, direct protection, I mean that uh, we don't need to go through the national track. Uh, to get protection of our 200, 250 geographical indications, which will be annexed to the agreement. This doesn't mean, of course, that we will uh, refuse what we could call the due process. So, of course, we uh, absolutely agree with the fact that the third countries would have a say and would have a right to examine whether or not these GIs deserve protection as a geographical indication. And we also uh, absolutely agree on the fact, and we do it ourselves, that these GIs would be subject to publication for oppositions. So any uh, interested person with valid argument could oppose uh, for the protection of these uh, geographical indications. But again, we would not go through the national track, like to pay fees, to go through a local agent, and uh, any other specific um, application form or whatever. So we comply with the due process, but we try to go through a simplified way to get a protection for a large number of geographical indications at the same time. And actually the third countries benefit also from this simplification because they can protect the whole batch of geographical indication in the EU at the same time. The other very important uh, issue, of course, is to get high level of protection. So TRIPS, what we call TRIPS plus. So not only we try to get extension or enhancement from TRIPS 22 for foodstuff to the TRIPS 23 level, but we also try to get evocation concept, as I just mentioned uh, before. The coexistence with prior trademarks uh, is also one of the key uh, provisions we must find in our uh, agreements. So it's not because there would be a prior registered trademark that it should preclude later protection of geographical indication. But in case the register, uh, the, a GI is already registered, uh, then it would preclude later or subsequent registration of a trademark. So this provision is also very important. There could be phase out of prior uses. So it could happen in some countries where for traditional reasons, there was no trademark, but we can find for, well, for many reasons, uh, some products using the reputation of products in a continuous manner for uh, many years on this market. So we tried to get use of it. It was the case, for instance, for champagne in Vietnam. So you can get access to the text with, uh, for Vietnam where I think uh, the name champagne, for instance, uh, was used for a long time, but it will have to be uh, phased out for a period of, after a period of uh, 10 years or 15 years, I can't remember exactly. Ex officio or administrative protection is also very important. So it was mentioned by uh, Raimondo Serra, the welcoming remarks. So we also expect from the third countries that in case of infringement, uh, we do not have to go to court uh, to get rid of the cases of infringement or usurpations. First, the administration could by itself take action in case they're aware of infringements or interested persons and stakeholders, GI holder, for instance, could go complain to the administration in this country. So it take action without going to, through a uh, court to get rid of infringement or abuses of the reputation. The right to use, uh, so again, I will not go too much into detail, but we expect that any person uh, complying with the specifications uh, can use uh, the GI name. No subsequent uh, genericness. So once the name is protected in the third countries, there is no reason that name could become generic unless it ceased to be protected. So what we are looking for is unlimited uh, protection uh, of the GI. So it's not for a period of 10 years or five years or 15 years. It's protection forever, as long as the name does not cease to be protected in the parties it is originally uh, protected. And then usually we also got some cooperation mechanism uh, to exchange uh, on possible changes in the product specifications between the EU 
and third uh, countries. Yeah, finally, due process, I will not get back to it. I already mentioned it in my first point. Uh, so it means that opposition for uh, publication and examination are uh, done uh, normally. A few words on the numbers. So to, in total, more than 1,534 EUGIs are protected uh, in third countries. Uh, most of them, of course, concern wines because we also got some specific wines bilateral agreements. You can see it a minute in the map. So around uh, 1,300 uh, wines are protected, EU wines are protected in uh, different third countries. 129 spirits uh, and a bit more than 106, uh, 116 agri products and foodstuff are protected on one uh, aromatized wine. There are many negotiations which were already uh, concluded. Uh, here you got a list of countries. I will not go into detail. Uh, but here you can see a map with uh, ongoing, uh, con well, concluded negotiations, uh, ongoing negotiations, and future um, negotiations. If you go to the region uh, Southeast Asia, for instance, uh, well, now we got more than 30 agreements concluded, FTAs and standalone. Um, in ASEAN, we got two uh, FTAs uh, concluded, one with Singapore entered into force and the one with Vietnam will enter into force in the coming weeks. We got a standalone agreement between the EU and China on GIs. Uh, on China, there was no perspective of an FTA, but we uh, negotiated a standalone agreement because we had some common interest in protecting our uh, GIs. I will come back on this in a minute. Still in Asia, we got an FTA with South Korea and we also entered into force now seven years ago. And we got an uh, FTA with Japan. We still got uh, 15 ongoing negotiations, some of them in the region. So Thailand uh, was on hold since uh, six years now uh, for political reasons. It's on hold in Malaysia uh, also for five to six years. Um, negotiation is ongoing and going very well with Indonesia, so we expect it could be concluded in the coming months or coming uh, coming year with Indonesia. And Philippines, it's still on hold uh, also for political uh, reasons. Ongoing and active in the region, we still got Australia and New Zealand um, negotiations uh, under FTAs. Just a few words, uh, I took the EU Vietnam FTA as an example. Uh, so uh, we got the recognition of high level of protection directly through the argument of EU GIs and Vietnamese GIs. The level of protection is comparable to the one we would have uh, in the EU system. EU um, has uh, 169 GIs annexed to this agreement, which will benefit directly from uh, protection in Vietnam. And Vietnamese will get uh, 39 uh, geographical indications protected at once in the EU uh, when the FTA will enter uh, into force. So it's, of course, one of the added value of an FTA because in case Vietnam would have asked for registration individually for the 39 GIs, it would have taken much more time than the FTA negotiations. It would have been more costly because maybe some uh, lawyers would have been to be hired. Maybe some group of producers would not have gone through it. So clearly that was a great added value for, all, for the EU, but also for the Vietnamese. So usually it's a win-win uh, situation when we find a deal uh, on GIs. GIs can coexist with prior registered trademark. Uh, they cannot become generic. So all these provisions you can find in the uh, text. I will not go too much into detail. EU-China standalone agreement, yes, just to say you a word on this specific uh, case. So usually we protect through FTAs or one agreements. Um, but with China, there was no chance, or at least no perspective of an FTA at short term. But we realized that we all, uh, both parties, had strong interest in protecting their geographical indication. There was a light, large number of GIs, both sides. So after a few years of negotiations, uh, this agreement was concluded uh, last November. We will protect uh, 100 GIs uh, from EU in China, and China uh, will pro well. We will reciprocally protect 100 GIs, and we already agreed to add uh, 175 GIs uh, each side uh, within four year after entry into force of this uh, agreement. So in total, we will get more than 275 GIs protected, both sides uh, within a few years with a high level of protection.
Finally, besides these bilateral uh, agreements, FTAs or standalone agreements, I just wanted to say a few words on uh, multilateral, multilateral uh, protection. I already mentioned that we consider at the EU that the TRIPS level of protection is not sufficient, but there is another way to protect uh, geographical indication at multilateral level. It's uh, through WIPO and the Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement. So you, most of you already know that the EU joined uh, this uh, Geneva Act last uh, February, and I think we were the fifth member. Uh, so because the EU joined, uh, the Geneva Act was uh, in a position to enter into force immediately after. So this is another way to protect um, a large number of GIs possibly um, in different uh, countries at the same time. Um, this is the only realistic multilateral basis today as TRIPS is not uh, sufficient. It provides for indefinitive uh, protection of GI, so there is no limit uh, in time. It's fully compatible with TRIPS with higher level of protection um, and it covers GIs uh, in a general uh, definition uh, as before the Lisbon Agreement was limited to denomination of origin. So this is another uh, added value. In the region, Cambodia actually was the first uh, member of the Geneva Act. And we know that Laos uh, may be the second country in the region to, to become a member. Uh, maybe some others here in the region are considering uh, accession to this, uh, to this act. So EU is also following this, this track but it doesn't uh, prevent from continuing our efforts through uh, bilateral agreements, uh, of course, which remains our top priority as we can uh, protect uh, a large number of GIs according to the terms of the agreement. So this is in a nutshell what I wanted to say on the, yeah, the EU approach to protect its geographical indication on the international market. Uh, no time to go much more into detail. Most of you are already informed because we are in negotiations or we already did some presentation on that um, in the region. So in case you got any, any questions, uh, I may try, of course, to, to, to I would be pleased to, to answer. Thank you very much. Okay, so one question very quick is on the status of the FTA between EU and Thailand. And how many GIs do you expect to be protected under the... FTA, if that is um, eventually signed, if you know. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the questions. Well, first, uh, we stopped negotiations in 2014, and we are still now, um, well, because of political reasons, but we were authorized uh, by the Council, uh, so by the member states, to, to restart technical discussions in view of the resumption of these FTA negotiations. So we are currently in a permanent dialogue with the Thai authorities and with DIP and Ministry of Commerce, DTN, uh, Department of Trade Negotiations, to assess um, or to reassess what we call the scoping exercise. So we want to make sure that the EU and Thailand got the same level of ambition, not only for geographical indications, uh, I'm talking of all the chapters of the FTA, before we engaged in the reception. But we are quite well advanced in that work. And uh, if everything okay, we could expect that uh, if backed by the political uh, level in Thailand and the EU in the coming months, we could uh, technically resume uh, the negotiations in the coming months, maybe early next year. Um, as regards the number of GIs, so we would not start from scratch because we already exchanged a negotiated text with Thailand before 2014 suspension. Uh, by that time, there was a list exchange, uh, both sides, which was the same list that you could find in the Vietnam uh, FTA agreement. So I think it's around a list of 170 uh, names. I can't remember the exact number of GIs on the Thai side, which was communicated by that time. But of course, this is subject to rediscussion with uh, Thailand uh, DIP and the EU because, um, well, first, Thailand now got more GIs than they used to have five years ago. So they may be interested to, in, to, in, to change the list and to get more GIs covered on board. And it would be possibly the same for the EU. Maybe we would find more interest for additional GIs to be protected in Thailand now. Um, and of course, because of Brexit, for instance, we would have to withdraw 
uh, Scotch whiskey. I think Scotch whiskey was the only GI name from the UK. Maybe there were one or two others. But obviously, there would be some slight changes. But again, we would be close to 200 GIs, most probably, on the EU side. And uh, on the Thai side, up to them to decide if they want to modify the list uh, in, the coming, in the coming months. Well, we will uh, resume negotiations. Thank you, uh, Laurent. When the EU joined the Geneva Act of the Lisbon Agreement, uh, what benefits or costs are expected by the EU? Well, one of the first benefit, uh, first, is that international organization can be member of this, uh, can now be member of the Geneva Act, which was not the case before. So only a few member states were a member, I think seven member states were member of the Geneva Act. So now the EU Commission uh, will be the member as such uh, of, this, uh, of this Act. So the EU would be the administrative actor, uh, the EU Commission would be the administrative actor for the EU uh, in that respect. So we would uh, apply, we would be only one um, organization applying for the GIs after member states notify their interest for, uh, for protection. Um, and of course, the other main benefit on top of the high level of protection is that for the GIs, which would be applied for protection under the Lisbon Agreement, uh, they could be protected in many uh, third countries at the same time. So this is the other uh, main added value, I would say. Thank you. How are disputes resolved in case um, there are two competing groups or communities that are eligible to use the GI? Um, can one group exclude the other? And the other question is, um, uh, if the country does not have a sui generis system, um, is it possible for one group to exclude another group even if they satisfy or they meet the requirements for the use of the GI name? But it's a bit uh, contradictory. So if I understood well, well the case was um, a community trying to exclude another group of producers from using the geographical indication, if that would be possible, right? Yes. Okay, that will not be possible. Okay, so once we have the, the geographical indication register, we have a specifications uh, in which uh, we must explain what are the technical requirements and the geographical area, okay? As long as, put the case, a new producer, a new company uh, establishes the, uh, its production in the geographical area that we define and he may meet the rest of requirement that are disclosed in the specification, he should be entitled to this geographical indication, okay? So excluding the use of the geographical indication is not a possibility. So uh, once uh, the application is filed, we have to take into account that uh, if registered, they could be available to all kinds of producers. I mean, and I, I, I refer in, even to foreign companies, foreign companies that s establish their production in the geographical area where, uh, which we define in the geographical indication. So, so uh, uh, we cannot uh, put barriers to new users, new communities, and so on, as long as they fulfill all the requirements we have in the book of specification. I think that uh, that was um, pretty much what uh, the question was about, right? Yes, thank you, Aitor. Um, the next question is um, probably for Laurent. Out of the, uh, well, here the figure is 69. Out of the 69 non-EU GIs registered in the EU, how many of them were, uh, are protected via bilateral agreements? And how many of them are protected via direct application? Oh, so maybe I, it's for you. If I because I think there was a misunderstanding he, here. Mm -hmm. uh, 69 uh, non-EU geographical indication registered under the sui generis system, okay? Actually mm -hmm. applied for, as I said, uh, around 40 out of these 69 non-EU GIs applied for are already registered. This is under the sui generis uh, system under the registration, uh, following the registration process, I explained, okay? So uh, non-EU non GIs 
protecting the European Union and the bilateral agreements are a larger number, a much larger number. And uh, I pass the floor to, to Laurent, I don't... Yes, and thank you. I do not get the exact number, but it's a few hundreds GIs from third countries, or if not thousands, which are protected uh, in the EU without being registered uh, in, the, in, in the EU system. They are directly protected by the fact they are annexed to the agreement because the international agreements doesn't need, uh, once they are protected in the agreement and contained in the annex, they don't need to be uh, registered in the EU system to be protected. Of course, they are protected according to the terms of the agreement. So it also happens in some occasions that some names which are protected in international agreements may also apply or were already, uh, well, may also apply for direct protection, but it's very exceptional. So usually it's, you, you can consider that once, well, for instance, the Vietnamese 39 names I mentioned, or the Korean names, uh, 60 something, uh, they are directly protected, but you will not find them in the statistics uh, ITOR uh, presented because they don't need to be registered as such. Um, thank you. So is the use of PDO and PGI um, compulsory or voluntary for registered products in the EU? I will take this one. Okay. Yeah. And then please clarify the difference between PDO and PGI. I think you had a slide, uh, but maybe they want to repeat. Okay. Uh, I did not uh, cover this issue. The use of the PDO and PGI, the, the concept itself, the, the, the acronym, and the use of the symbols, the European symbols, are compulsory for European products. Okay, only for European products. For non-EU products, uh, it is up to the producer whether they want to use it or not. Okay, they have the right. Uh, foreign producers, which are covered by a, a non-EU GI register in the in the European Union, it's up to them. So it's not compulsory for foreign GIs compulsory for European GIs, okay? okay. And the second part was Do they, um, uh, clarification for, about the difference between PDO and PGI and also if they need to pertain to geographical names. Ah, okay. Well, first, they do not need to be, uh, the, the name does not have to be a, a geographical name necessarily, okay? What is important is the name identifies a product as coming from a specific origin. But uh, most of the cases, in most of the cases, the name is a geographical name, okay? But we have some cases in which the name is not geographical. But even though it is not geographical, it serves to identify the product as produced in a specific origin, okay? That's, that's, that's a feta, for instance, Logant, uh, was talking about the FETA case, okay? Uh, FETA is a, a geographical indication, a European one, is, is a, a Greek cheese. The name FETA is not a geographical name, okay? But any European consumer will identify the name FETA as a, referring to a, a Greek cheese a, produced in a specific a, region, okay? So, first of all, they do not need to be a geographical name, although most of the time they are geographical geographical names, okay? If, if I may add on what uh, Aito just mentioned, uh, for the names, non-EU geographical indications which are protected and registered in the EU, they can use the EU logo. Yes, yeah, sure. Which, which is not the, in their country. It's So for instance, uh, Doi Tung Coffee in Thailand, they can use the EU logo because they are registered in the EU system. So they can do it. Patalung rice, they can use the logo, which is not necessarily the case for GIs which are protected through uh, international agreements. I think that, that question was, was on that. The example would be Kampot pepper. Um, so they can use the yeah, Kampot logo. pepper, clearly they can use the EU logo, yeah. Okay, yeah, the question referred to the use in the European Union, just Logan was totally right. I mean, is is the, the the registration through the sui generis system what uh, gives the right to use the the, the logo and so Campot Pepper, uh, Colombian coffee that they are registered under the sui generis yeah. system, they can use the, the logo, yeah. Which usually they do, even if it's not monetary, they choose to do it because it's also a marketing tool, yeah. not only to access the EU market, but it's also a mark of quality to be registered and considered as a geographical uh, indication by the EU. 
So we can see, so for instance, some uh, rice uh, in Thailand, which was protected now almost 10 years ago in Europe, not necessarily increased exports of this rice in the EU, but thanks to the registration as a GI in the EU, they expanded their exports to China, for instance. So it's clearly used as a marketing tool too. So another question uh, related. Will, uh, is possible for GIs protected under or through FTAs and other bilateral agreements be allowed to use the symbols of GIs if they're protected under FTAs? No, uh, the question is no in principle, but not impossible. Uh, <laughs> So, um, in principle, they are not authorized to use the logo unless it would be negotiated in the agreement. Uh, but we can expect that it would not be agreed unless we reach the exact content of the level of protection on any other provisions we could find in the EU. Um, but we now got a legal uh, provision which was introduced in a revision of the basic legislation on the geographical uh, indication in the EU to transfer the names which are annexed in an FTA to the register. So now we, so that's why it's no, but not impossible. Uh, we could uh, transfer these names uh, in the uh, GI register. And in that case, automatically they would be authorized to use uh, the logo. Thank but you. we have no experience. We have no example of uh, an FTA uh, where uh, GIs from third countries were granted the use of the logo but could happen in the future, I don't know. Is there a fee to register a GI in the EU? At no, the no, EU no. level, no. Oh, it's free of fees. Mm -hmm. there, could be so some, uh, there could be some fees at the member state level when they are first registered in the member state. Uh, but, or the administrative procedure could be subject to a fee depending on the member state. But from third countries, GIs, uh, as they directly apply or are protected through an agreement, or even if they directly apply, there is no fee to pay to the EU for free. Oh, thank you. So in the case, of, I will have, I have three more questions to ask, and the rest uh, I thought will probably be able to answer during the second webinar. So in the case of non-use uh, of a GI for seven years, what office in the EU will cancel the registration of the, of the GI? or um, should the cancellation be filed by a third party? Okay, well, I read uh, this question. I think it referred to the EU IPO. I wanted to clarify, no, it's not the EU IPO, the authority which will invalidate the, the GI, is the DG Agri, okay? The Directorate, Directorate General for Agriculture, okay? And it can happen both ways, okay? According to the law, if, if, if you take a, I look to the law, to, to the law. it can happen ex officio, the, the DG Agri will have the possibility to cancel the, the geographical indication ex officio, which I think it will, be, it will very rarely happen, and it can also happen at the request of any interested party, o okay? Anyway, I mean, the, there are very, very few cases of cancel geography, of um, uh, invalidated geographical indication. Most of the time it has been uh, at the request of the own producers. Okay. okay thank you. Last question. Uh, what, is the reg what is the rule on coexistence uh, between GI and trademark in the EU? If we refer to later GI, I mean uh, uh, GI application, a GI application against a prior trademark, as I said, a trademark application will not preclude the registration of a letter in GI unless it is reputed in a way that the registration of the letter GI will be liable to mislead the public as to the true identity of the wood. Okay. That, that would be the only case. For, so for a prior registered trademark not enjoying this level of reputation, uh, the, the situation would be a coexistence uh, with, the, with the later GI. And if we are talking the other way around, if we are talking about uh, later trademark applications filed, filed uh, to, before the EU IPO, for instance, to, to be registered, okay, a formal geographical indication can prevent the, the registration of a, of a later of a later trademark which would be conflicting with the name, I mean. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much.